everyone to Health for the World International Grand Rounds. We are really honored to have our Grand Rounds speaker today, Dr. Frank Lexa, who's a renowned neuroradiologist and a radiology leader, uh, you know, who is uh, famous worldwide for his uh, amazing efforts. Uh, we also have um, uh, Dr. Ashim Bhatia, who's, who leads our Health for the World Pen Pennsylvania chapter and is also at Pittsburgh and a pediatric neuroradiologist. Um, I will let Dr. Ashim Bhatia take over. I hope everyone is keeping safe and staying well and, and a very warm welcome to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome, everyone, across the world. Uh, like was mentioned, thank you, Bobby, for the introduction. I'm here at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and we'll be moderating this fantastic Health for the World Grand Rounds. I have the honor of introducing our speaker, doc, Dr. Frank Lexa. He's an academic neurologist and currently a professor and vice chair for faculty affairs at the University of Pittsburgh, where he also does global radiology work for UPMC International. Today he's gonna to lecture on orbital trauma. So really looking forward to this. And Dr. Lexa needs no introduction, but we wanna highlight a few impressive accomplishments. He's been honored with several major scientific research awards, including the Cornelius G. Dyke Memorial Award of the American Society of Neurology. There he twice, twice won the prestigious prize of excellence for outstanding, outstanding teaching. He served as an ASR ambassador in Ukraine in 2017 and also has done international medical and education work on several continents, including volunteer work in Uganda, Thailand, China, and Russia. He has plans to serve again in Africa and Asia in the next two years. Uh, many of you might not know, he's a licensed airplane pilot flying back between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, I just learned, that's pretty, pretty amazing. And in his spare time, he bikes and chases after his two Portuguese water dogs, Rocky and Gabby, and has a pot Potbelly Pig Piper. So those very cool names. Uh, Dr. Alexa, the floor is yours and I'll be back for questions from the audience. And so just a reminder for anyone in the audience, if you wanna type in a question, there's a Q and A box in the bottom of your Zoom window. Go ahead and type the question and we'll, we'll uh, answer them at the end. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Bachi, very much for that kind introduction. And I also want to thank Dr. Rahani for um, just building this amazing program. I'm very honored to be part of this and to be invited to do it. And also a thank you to Dr. Bill Dillon, an old friend from my California days who helped link us up and um, you know, helped me uh, be arranged to do this. So um, what we're going to be doing today is talking about, as you can see, orbital trauma. And what we're gonna do in 40 minutes is um, try to give you a couple of structured ways of looking at orbital trauma. I'm sure everyone who's working in radiology, um, people who are working in other clinical disciplines, you, I'm sure you see orbital trauma. And so what we're gonna try to do is help you develop a more structured approach, talk about some of the key anatomic points, talk about some of the technical issues that occur when we do orbital imaging and help you just um, you know, up your game to you know, try to read cases um, in you know, more detailed fashion, try to catch some of the things that matter most to your patients and to your referring physicians. And uh, we'll go over some things that um, commonly occur in traumatic injury to the orbits and globes and talk about some related issues that are connected and at least touch on some of the other things that can happen in these types of cases. Now, when we look at orbital trauma, um, and this is true in North America where I, I'm currently working, but it's also true globally that usually our most common technology is CT for many reasons. Um, but it's not unusual to have some associated you know, issues in you know, orbital imaging. And this is an ACR construct. This is you know, the ACR recommendations for how to look at the orbits with vision and visual loss. And in the way the ACR does these things, high numbers are the things that are most recommended and then you know, lower numbers are less recommended. And for most things, CT is pretty good as you can see. In general, for non-traumatic issues in the globe and orbits with visual loss, we tend to go with MR. Um, but in the trauma setting, CT is really the thing we need most. And we you know, only need MR when we have some you know, 
issues that can't be resolved with CT, or we have complications of trauma, um, particularly damage to the brain and other structures that are next to the globes, near the, the globes and orbits, um, cranial neuropathies, things like that, where MRI would be um, more useful. Now, orbital trauma is difficult. And this is obviously a Philadelphia reference for those of you who've seen the movies, but um, this is a serious part of my role as a neuroradiologist and anyone who's doing imaging. Uh, we can see things that are hard for the ophthalmologist, the emergency room physician, the primary care provider, and they may not be able to see, or they may have a lot of trouble seeing. And this is for several reasons. And it's unusual because in most of orbital imaging, um, most, most of the things that happen with the eye, ophthalmologists have a unique ability to look inside the eye and they many times don't need much from us. But in trauma, they do, and it's for several reasons. One is that, as you can see here, yeah, after orbital trauma, the eye is swollen and often it is swollen shut and it may be impossible or nearly impossible to open that eye up and get a good look. And I was briefly an ophthalmology resident in a previous life a long time ago. And these are difficult patients. Um, many times the trauma has occurred um, because of drugs and alcohol or other things. So they're not particularly cooperative. They are in pain, they are angry patients. So they are difficult patients to examine. And for those of us who do imaging, this is an opportunity for us to see things that the examining physicians can't see. And so this is our chance to be heroes and to find the things that matter most to the patients when the clinical examiner can't find them. Now with trauma, we tend to focus on fractures. The history of radiology you know, really began with bones because those were the things that we could see you know, 100 years ago, but it's not just about fractures. And uh, in particular, in the orbits, it's about the eye. And the analogy here is like skull films for and the brain. Um, in my career, which is now over 25 years, we've pretty much gotten rid of skull films because most of the time, whether the skull film is positive or negative, we really needed a CT and we end up getting a CT because we care a lot more about the brain. Bones can heal. Um, this is from a slogan that's from the um, t-shirt that's very popular in the world of snowboarding. That's one of my kids, he's a snowboarder. And he has one of these shirts that say, bones heal, pain is temporary, glory is forever. That's the kind of thing that snowboarders like to say because they you know, get banged up a lot. But that's actually from a very famous person um, from when I was a little kid in the United States who was a motorcycle daredevil. He was the first person to say this. He used to take his motorcycle and jump over cars, buses, canyons. And um, he had lots of fractures. He had lots of orbital trauma, I'm sure. But again, the important thing here is that while fractures matter, you also have to look very hard and remember about soft tissue injuries because we don't wanna lose any eyes, just like we don't wanna lose any brains. And many times the issues are, again, not the fractures per se, you've got to find them. That's part of my job as a neuroradiologist is to find those fractures and make sure that um, everybody on the managing team of physicians and other practitioners knows about them. But it's fractures have complications associated with them. Acutely with orbital trauma, there's a lot of swelling, there's a lot of bleeding and the eye tends to stick out. So you have exophthalmus. More chronically, as things resolve, as the blood clears, as the swelling goes down, and as scarring or fibrosis occurs, you can have enophthalmus, meaning the eye is sunken within the orbit. Acutely, we can have diplopia from swelling in the muscles, from hemorrhage, from entrapment, and I'll show you some examples of these, and or nerve damage. Another important orbital complication is an air leak. If air can leak into the orbit from the sinuses, then so can bacteria. If you can see air, um, bacteria can be there. We, can't, we obviously don't see bacteria, but we see infection in these cases. And that's one of the known you know, complications. Um, sometimes you have blockage of the drainage system for the lacrimal system and epiphora is 
you know, one of the complications that can occur. And it's actually a very big complication. And it's a very hard thing to manage. It's hard to rebuild that system. And patients really, you know, complain about this after they've had orbital trauma. Sometimes we have nerve damage that leads to anesthesia. And sometimes the location of the anesthesia is a clue to where the fracture is going to be. We'll show you some examples of those. And then um, most importantly, in some cases, the complications of CSF leaks and intracranial injury. And remembering that the brain is nearby and the brain can you know, be damaged as well. So when someone comes in and they are getting scanned, they're getting an X-ray to look for an orbital fracture, remember to look at the brain. And every dictation I do when it's limited to the face, I have some kind of a comment in my dictation saying that the visualized portion of the brain is normal or unremarkable. Or there's no evidence of intracranial damage because you just have to remember to look at this. Now, you know, we, we talk a lot about having search patterns in radiology. Um, there's a huge amount of information on a CT or an MRI. There's a lot of information even on plain films. And it's important that you have some kind of a plan. Um, as Dr. Bhatia mentioned, um, you know, in one of the things that I like to do, I like to fly airplanes and it's just standard in this world that people use checklists. And uh, Dr. Atul Gawande, who's a very good medical writer, very famous medical writer here in the States, um, has talked about how you can adapt the use of checklists into the medical world. He's a surgeon but just so that we don't forget things. And whatever pattern you use, just make sure it's complete. One of the ways that I like to look at trauma in orbits is front to back. Start at the front because that's usually where the trauma has occurred and then work your way backwards all the way into the brain. Same way I look at trauma to the head. I usually look for the impact site and then look from outside in and start with the skin, go through the bones into the extraaxial spaces into the brain. Same idea here, have a plan. I look for foreign bodies that are imbe embedded either in the superficial soft tissues or in the globes. I look for soft tissue swelling. I look for corneal swelling and rupture. Look at the anterior chamber, look at the lens, and we'll go through the rest of this in a moment. Well, let's start by talking about just with foreign bodies. This is somebody who had relatively minor trauma in Philadelphia. They're a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, they later were having some uh, difficulty with their vision. And so they decided to get an MRI. Their, their referring physician sent them for an MRI. The technologist came running out and told me, we've got a problem. I looked at the scans. We definitely had a problem. There was some kind of a metallic foreign body here, all, you know, in her skull or in her uh, head. And we got some plain films. And what we found was this. And this was from unremembered trauma. She had been caught up in the civil wars that occurred in the uh, former Yugoslavia and had metallic foreign bodies. And these were all over the left side of her body. And one of them, was, you know, several of them actually on other, you know, parts of the scan were all over the left side of her head. And these are just, you know, small metallic foreign bodies, but a lot of susceptibility artifact. It is a strong reminder that every time we, you know, think about doing MRs on people with trauma or people who've been metal workers, it's a pretty common scenario in both Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, where we're both post-industrial cities and a lot of people who've been metal workers, make sure you know about the foreign bodies. Other kinds of foreign bodies, you know, they're not all metal and you have to be very careful. And this is something that I see getting missed or you know, misclassified fairly frequently. We'll have somebody who's had penetrating trauma to the globe, which we're gonna talk about more in a few minutes. And people will assume that something that's low density is just air because you know, there's been some kind of a puncture wound here and air got into the globe. But be careful, make sure you understand the mechanism of injury because wood, and this is kind of a trick question that we use on our trainees. You ask them, well, what's the attenuation, um, Hounsfield units, the attenuation appearance of a foreign body or of air or of wood in the globe? And if you ask about wood, the answer is it can be hypoattenuating if it's dry. It can be relatively iso 
you know, if it's wet and it can even be hyper if it's got um, leaded paint on it. And so I've seen examples of wood in the eye that has all three of those characteristics. And this is actually a chunk of wood that's in the middle of the eye. So you need to be careful. Um, always look for those foreign bodies. And sometimes they're radio dense, sometimes they're ISO, and sometimes they can be hypo. Here's another one, and this was a subtle one, but um, this was a CT that we had on a patient who'd had some trauma and you know, had this little thing here, which I think people assumed was just a little chunk of calcium. And you know, this is a hard one because it really is small. But, you know, and if you fall down on some of our city streets in North America, there can be, you know, dirt in the street, there can be small pieces of glass in the street. Glass also has different characteristics depending on what kind of glass it is. If it's very expensive leaded crystal, it can be pretty dense. If it's safety glass from cars that has a lot of plastic in it and that can be relatively hypo dense, but just be careful. This turned out to be metal. This is an MR from the same patient. And again, I get a call from the technologist. I go back and look and there was a little metallic foreign body there. But let's keep going with our paradigm. So we've talked about foreign bodies. We've talked about some of these things, but let's finish it out. Once we go back from the lens and traumatic cataracts, things like that, you wanna look at the globe. This is probably the single or the number two most important thing on this list, right up there with intracranial injuries, make sure the globe's intact. And one of the things that I was taught about the spinal cord when I was in my neuroradiology fellowship is the spinal cord should always be pristine, meaning it's normal size, normal shape, normal signal intensity, has a very smooth surface. If it's not, then there's a problem. The globe should be pristine. If it has the edges look off, if the shape looks off, if the size is off, you've got a problem, the patient has a problem. So make sure you look for the globe injuries. Once you're inside the globe, you look for vitreal hemorrhage, subhyoid hemorrhage, chorio and retinal dislocations um, and detachments, uh, retrobulbar hemorrhage, extraocular muscle injury, vascular injury, and then again, always check the brain. Um, failure to, to do these kinds of things can lead to bad outcomes. This is from an exoneration, which is not the kind of outcome you want. Now, I promise you, we will not go through a lot of anatomy. Um, you know, all of you have probably had some form of, you know, anatomy training. Um, you can look this kind of stuff up. I just want to focus on the main thing. So don't worry, we're not going to do 10 or 20 slides on anatomy and the embryology of the eye and all that. Um, but I want to use an analogy here to how we teach how to, to read brain studies. One of the most important things in neuroradiology is putting things into the right spaces. And that means is something in the brain, is something in the epidural space, is it in the subdural space? Um, that's true in the brain, it's true in the spinal cord. Most of head and neck, at least good head and neck uh, reads relate to putting things into the right space. And if you can put something into the correct space and say this is a mass, um, it's in the masticator space, then here's the differential for it. Same thing here. And we're just going to go through a couple very quick things. If uh, it, anybody who's ever read out with me in training knows that one of the questions I like to ask is tell me what are, you know, where the holes in the head are and tell me what goes through the holes in the head. Here, it's pretty simple because you don't have very many holes. You have the superior orbital fissure, you have the inferior orbital fissure, and you've got the optic canal. And if you know what goes through them, then you know what would be damaged by fractures that are involving these territories. And we know what would be dysfunctional. So if you have a fracture through the orbital apex that nails the optic canal, then you're likely to get visual loss because the optic nerve is going to be involved. Or where, you know you could have ophthalmic artery damage, et cetera. Um, also remember that these holes allow spread. So if you have hemorrhage, if you have edema, if you have infection, if you have tumors, this is how they move between the globe and the intracranial space. Um, in terms of the key subdivisions, it's pretty simple. So it's the anatomy here is not complicated. There are other parts of the body where it gets much more complex, um, but here it's pretty simple. Um, infections that are preceptal, hematomas that are preceptal are much less of a deal for the patient than things that are postceptal. 
Hemorrhage back here can cause compartment syndromes. And at the very end of this talk, I'm gonna show you a nasty example of one of those, but preceptal, postseptal. This is the septum and you know, just describing where things are and just knowing that it's in one place or the other, or if it's transpatial, meaning it's growing across, you know, those are things that the surgeons need to know, the ophthalmologists need to know, the neurologists need to know these things. Same thing with intraconal versus extraconal. Intraconal, there's your optic nerve, that's the conduit for this patient's vision. Things that are in here that are push, pushing on the nerve are more likely to be a problem than things that are out here. Maybe they're causing some diplopia or some cosmetic problems, but make sure you know the difference between the conal, intraconal space, extraconal space, and pre and post septal. So that is the sort of minimalist approach to the anatomy of the orbit. Now, in real life, things don't always follow simple systems. And that's why I think it's important that you have a very structured approach to looking at orbital trauma. Um, because if you have a system, then you can deal with the real world, which tends to get messy. And we'll talk about a system in a moment, but this is a typical example of the messy aspects of the real world. There are multiple fractures here. They don't fit, some of them don't fit into neat categories, um, but this was a very interesting patient. This is one of the most you know, interesting stories for facial trauma that I have. And I, I see facial trauma pretty much every day that I'm on duty because it's very common in our emergency rooms. But this was somebody who, when he got to be you know, a little bit older than me, he had a birthday and decided that to celebrate this birthday, and I think he was about 70 when he did this, he decided he would jump out of an airplane with a parachute and um, to sort of celebrate this. And I think it's because at that time, one of the former presidents of the United States, uh, the older George Bush, decided to do this for one of his birthdays. And he did it with a group of professionals from, I think it was the US Army, and you know, he jumped and it was fine. I think he did it again on another birthday. Um, as you can tell with where this story is going, it didn't turn out so well for this gentleman. This, um, there's a portion of New Jersey, which is the state that's next to Pennsylvania, um, that is very popular for parachuting. He did a tandem jump, which means he went with an instructor and they were sort of, you know, they're together and they, they pull their shoots together. There was a problem. The shoots did not work. Um, the follow-on shoots, I think, got tangled. And more or less, he was going at about terminal velocity, at least as fast as a human being can go through the air as they plummet towards you know, New Jersey in this case. He must have hit a very soft part of New Jersey because in the end, the only thing that happened to him was that he had a lot of orbital and facial trauma. And um, one of the people who trained me used to say that the job of the face and the orbits is to protect the brain. And to some extent, that is what happened here. So this sort of crumpled, but absorbed the energy. And believe it or not, this guy who's about seven years old walked out of the hospital. His brain was okay. Obviously a lot of facial damage, but his brain was okay. And it's a lead into talking about how we classify fractures that involve the orbits or can involve structures adjacent to the orbits, the kind of fractures you're going to see when you're doing orbital imaging. And this is from Dr. Lafour's work. He was a French um, scientist and he came up with a classification system that is still used in many parts of the world. Um, he was, must have been a very interesting uh, gentleman. Um, the way they did this is they experimented with climbing up on the roof of his favorite bar and dropping skulls off the roof. They also dropped cannonballs onto fresh cadavers. I think for those of you who've thought about writing scientific grants, I don't think that these kinds of things would get funded today, um, but it certainly sounds like they were having a lot of fun going to their bar and then um, doing science there. And he came up with a system that is, I think, I think it is very useful, even though in the real world fractures don't always follow these uh, paradigms exactly. It is very helpful because it reminds me every time I look at a patient with facial fractures, I try to see if they fit. And it reminds me to look at all the key areas because when the face breaks, the face has weak parts of it. Just like if you break a cracker that has an edge in, within the middle of it um, that is designed to break, there are parts of the face that are more likely to break than others. And a LaFour one is just this detachment of the lower part of the maxilla. 
Uh, Lafort 2 is this pyramidal type fracture that runs through the orbits bilaterally. And this part of the face is popped off. And then a uh, Lafort 3, which is obviously the worst one, you have fractures going through the orbits across the nasal bridge here. And then you have a pretty much a detachment of the face from the skull. So that's the first insight that Lafour came up with is that there are patterns that often occur with facial trauma. And even though today most of us don't see cannonball injuries, we do see injuries in cars where a face will hit the dashboard of a car. We see motorcycle injuries. We see, you know, you know, people fighting with each other, hitting each other in the face. And these kinds of fractures still occur. The other important insight, and this is the one I wanna emphasize more, and I think it's the deeper insight literally um, that Lafour came up with, is that it's not just the external parts of the face that are damaged, always look deep. And in his classification, pterygoid plate involvement is critical. And that is a critical insight. And that's a very important insight because you don't wanna look just at the surface of the face, you wanna look deep inside because sometimes these fractures do go into the deep structures. And here's a typical real world fracture. And if you go through the classification system, there's a Lafour one on the right here. You can see the detachment of part of the maxilla that's intact on the left side. We see a fracture here going through the orbit. So that's actually part of a Lafour two. And we can see that this pterygoid plate is broken and then the root here of the pterygoid plates is broken off. So it's not unusual to see differences from side to side or to see more than one kind of fracture on the same side. But this kind of a structured approach allows you to you know, look at all the key elements and look at the places where the fractures are most likely to occur. And obviously there's a fracture out here laterally as well. Same thing happens when we focus on the orbits themselves. Now we can have orbital fractures that are part of Lafour fractures, as I just said, but you can also have fractures that are unique to the orbits without involvement of the rest of the face. And classically, these have you know, been discussed in terms of blowout fractures, which involve the floor, the medial wall, and occasionally the lateral wall of the orbits. When you're in the roof, it's called a blow up fracture. And these are fractures where the soft bones within the, uh, that surround the orbit get blown out away from the globe. Or, you know, and you know, the blow up fractures were described in 1957. That's a long time ago, it's before I was born. But the blow in fractures, which is sort of an opposite kind of fracture, and I'll show you examples of both in a moment, there are, Better, a better name for them are nasoorbital ethmoidal fractures. Occasionally, they're also called mid-phase smash fractures because the center of the face is smashed in. But like Lafour fractures, don't worry as much about the classification. Just know it and let it guide you to look at what's going on. Because you will see examples of an orbital wall that's both in and out. We, we, we do see that because not everything will fit into a nice system, but at least this allows you to have a structured approach to looking at things. With blowouts, by definition, the rim has to stay intact. If the rim is broken, it's not really a blowout, it's an orbital rim fracture. In the literature, it says that inferior blowouts are most common than the medials, than the roof. In Philadelphia, in my experience, and in some of the other places where I've worked, I would actually argue that I see more medial wall fractures than floor fractures. I think it, these bones are really thin. It's easy to break them. But you know, this is what's in the literature. So that's what I'm you know, sharing with you here as a bullet point. And like many things in, in medicine, people come up with proposed mechanisms. And so one, one idea is that you just increase the pressure in the orbit um, if you don't try this on yourself, but if you just think about it for a moment, if you were to hit your face, your fist, face with your fist right now, your fist is a bit bigger than the size of the orbit. So you probably won't go deep into the orbit, but you might increase the pressure in the orbit. Um, that means you're less likely to actually destroy the globe, but you can get fractures. Um, same thing with an American baseball. If that hits the, a person in the orbit, it's unlikely to actually go in and destroy the globe because it's too big. It won't fit into the front of the orbit, but it could increase the pressure and cause a, a blowout fracture. 
Smaller balls like squash balls and golf balls are actually far more dangerous because they can go through the front of the orbit and destroy a globe. And so can hockey pucks, depending on how they hit you. And we see a lot of hockey puck injuries um, in some parts of the US where that sport is popular. Another idea is that the rim just buckles, but it pops back and called plastic buckling. And the other idea is that if the globe gets hit by something, it acts like a billiard ball and it shoots across the orbit and hits these, these bones and breaks them. So those are three mechanisms that we see um, invoked to try to explain blowouts. Now with inferior fractures, it's pretty straightforward. This is an example of an inferior blowout on the left. You can see the, the break here. You can see this is the inferior complex, which includes the inferior oblique and the inferior rectus. And you can see that this is tethered down here. And this person will probably have vertical diplopia, meaning that they're seeing, they, they can't get conjugate vi vision. And so this has both cosmetic as well as functional, you know, ocular motility com complications and needs to be fixed. Um, here's an example of a repair. You can see that this is swung down. Um, sometimes people call this, this kind of a fracture, a trap door where this goes down and that needs to be either pushed up and or you know, put, have a prosthesis put in so that the eye doesn't look sunken. And again, that you can have normal vision. Um, in an axial plane, this sometimes you know, looks like this. I realize most of us have coronal reconstructions or direct coronal imaging. But if you just look on the axial plane and double check to make sure that it's a pretty symmetric image, and this has symmetric zygomatic arches, nasal bones are kind of symmetric, the pterygopalatine fossa looks reasonably symmetric. So this shouldn't be here. And that's just an old fracture. Now, sometimes things can blow up into the frontal bone. And so we've talked about inferior blowouts, we've talked about medial blowouts, frontal blowups. Uh, it's, you know, again, this is a, uh, a blowout fracture, but it, people call it up because that's the direction. But this is one where you have to be particularly careful because there are complications here that you have to watch out for. You see the soft tissue swelling, you see a through and through fracture here through the frontal bone and the frontal sinus, and you see that this has gone intracranially. So you have several things to worry about here. And the people treating the patient have several things to worry about. One is an infection from the frontal sinus. Uh, another is damage to the adjacent brain. The frontal lobe of the brain is right here. And then also long-term complications like mucoceles, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. But here's what a blow up, and that's just a superior blowout fracture looks like. Here's the medial orbital wall. Here's the inferior orbital wall. They look pretty good. But up here, we've got a comminuted fracture and it goes up into the frontal sinus. And then there's also the orbital rim is broken here as well. And with the blow up fractures, it depends on whether or not you have an aerated orbital roof. If you don't have much of a frontal sinus, it's hard to break it. Um, but then we worry again about infection, CSF leaks, epidural hemorrhage, and brain parenchymal contusions. So again, always look at that brain. Always look at all the brain you can see anyway. Sometimes you can get diplopia with lateral orbital fractures like this. This is the lateral orbital wall. This is a you know, part of a, a larger fracture complex, the zygomatical com complex fracture. Old name is the tripod fracture. But you can see that this is going to impinge on the lateral rectus. And this person will have trouble moving their eye. I have gotten a few referrals over the years where it said rule out lateral rectus palsy, rule out third nerve damage, um, which for neuroradiologists is kind of a red flag for perhaps an aneurysm pressing on the third nerve. These are things we get excited about. And then we look on the scan and we notice that it's probably more likely this is mechanical impingement on the lateral rectus rather than an acute cranial neuropathy. Another example, similar problem. This is an old fracture. There's some foreshortening here. There's some more trauma going on here. And that's just affecting ocular motility, but it's not related to an acute third or an acute sixth nerve complication. Um, with medial blowouts, another complication that they get is all this air leak. And you can see that there's a lot of air here. This is you know, the medial 
wall of the orbit is blown out here. Again, this is literally paper thin bone. If you ever um, do a, anatomic dissection, um, this, this bone is tiny, it's thin, it's got little holes in it, it's very easy to break it. And then we have air coming in and we can see that there's air that's both extraconal and intraconal. And as we said earlier, if air can move, so can bacteria. Do your sinuses have bacteria in them? Absolutely. And you don't want that, those bacteria to get into the soft tissue. And again, with our preceptal, postceptal question, here's the medial check ligament on the left. You can see that this is you know, all air that's behind the septum. Um, and you can see different patients, same problem, lots of air, lots of crepitus here in the um, in the eyelids. Again, with orbital trauma, the fracture is not always the biggest issue. Obviously, there's a fracture here. And we see the fracture. We can see that there's some opacification of the right frontal sinus here. There's preceptal soft tissue swelling here. But the most important things are the things that are back here. And we can see that there's blood and there's a contusion in the brain. And if we compare to the other side, I know that there's some artifact running through here, but this is real and there's blood there. And so we have intracranial damage in addition to all this. So again, one of the, the cliches we use when we're talking about how to look at, at studies is we talk about satisfaction of search. Well, I found the fracture, I found this. Now you gotta keep going and you've gotta make sure you get through your search pattern, your checklist, however you think about it, and make sure you look at everything. Um, I mentioned that we would talk about nasoorbital ethmoidal fractures. Um, technically, these sometimes get called you know, blow-in fractures because, again, instead of this thin piece of bone getting blown, you know, let me go back for one second, getting blown in here, it gets, you know, excuse me, blown out from the orbit, it gets blown into the orbit because the vector of force came this way, smashed the middle of the face, and then it kind of blew out like this. Um, you know, blew, blew, excuse me, blew in to the orbit like this. So these are blow in fractures as opposed to the blow out. Again, the reference is where it's moving relative to the globe. But I like NOE fractures because it describes the bones that are broken and it's, it's a little bit more important in many ways, not for the fact that this bone is pushed over here, but that some other things are going on, including compromise of the ethmoid air cells, compromise of the lacrimal drainage system, other functional things that matter more than just some irregular bone over here. So always look for these. Um, these also have complications. If you destroy the nasal um, bony structures, you can have both bone as well as ligamentous injuries. This has to be fixed. If it's not fixed, you will get a, a nasty um, cosmetic defect and you probably won't be able to have conjugate gaze. You'll be walking around with double vision. So it, and it's important that the surgeons know about any, you know, evidence for both the fractures and for displacement that would signify that there's probably also been a soft tissue injury because this is again, a combined repair to fix all of this. Another complication of these things, and another reason why I don't like calling them blow-in fractures, is that um, many times the frontal sinus drainage system is affected. So you can not only have lacrimal involvement, you can also have frontal sinus drainage involvement. And sometimes this leads to mucoceles. And if you get a mucoceles, you, they may have to do a frontal sinus obliteration to prevent that. Um, other soft tissue injuries that we have to watch out for, um, again, it's not just the fractures, but this is a big hematoma along the medial rectus. There's a lot of preceptal soft tissue swelling. There's the medial check ligament. So we've got problems that are both pre and postseptal in this patient. And this is going to interfere with ocular motility. This person is going to have trouble moving uh, their eye. And as you can tell, this would be a very hard patient to examine. So we can be helpful to them in ex explaining this is why the eye can't move very well because there's a large hematoma there. Um, some other soft tissue things to watch out for is that you know, pretty much every neuroradiologist I know has at least one of these you know, and has that in their collection, but this is just a lens that's been knocked and now it's back here. When it sits right on the optic nerve head, 
you, you actually don't have vision here, right? So with the lens here, you know, the patient may be able to walk around with this and not really notice it. Now, if it falls onto, you know, the active part of the retina over here, then yes, their vision would be gone as this cataractus lens was over there. But if it's sitting right here, um, the patient may not really notice it. Other soft tissue injury related to that, um, we can see corneal swelling uh, with this person who is banged in the eye. We can also see edema and or fragmentation of the lens. And here's a relatively normal lens on the other side. So again, start, at, start out here and move in. That's a good way to make sure you don't miss anything. One of the consequences of trauma, this is a post-traumatic cataract. Um, this is somebody who got hit a while back and then had a cataract, which then calcified. And this is a calcified cataract. Um, more important soft tissue injuries are looking for intraocular hemorrhage. And here's an example of some hemorrhage back here. I think this was a hockey puck injury. You can see there's some preceptal soft tissue swelling. Um, and you can see that there's a straight line here. So this is probably a, a vitreal separation with some hemorrhage here. And you always wanna look at, you know, look at the globes. And you know, I, I try when I'm talking to my trainees to say, when you're looking at the brain, always make sure you look at the eyes. When you look at the eyes, make sure you look at the brain. Um, Cause again, trauma, you know, doesn't respect boundaries always. And you may have more than one injury. Now, retinal and choroidal detachments are complicated. Um, sometimes in a book, there are some nice clean examples where you'll have a V-shaped abnormality, which we know is a retinal detachment. That's actually separation of parts of the retina from each other. Um, the apex is right at the optic disc and this extends out. You can also have U-shaped choroidal detachments. That's because these usually stop at vortex veins, which are lateral to um, the optic disc. But when you, look in the real world, it sometimes gets to be pretty messy. This is a classic V-shaped retinal detachment. That's an ultrasound. Um, but in the real world, we sometimes have trauma like this. And it's hard to tell what's underneath all that and to tell what's choroid, what's retina, and what's vitreal hemorrhage. So don't be surprised if, you know, for everyone you see that's absolutely positively choroidal detachment versus retinal detachment, you may see something like this, which is a bit messy and you may need to follow it up um, and make sure you know what's underneath that and make sure that it resolves. Now, as we close this up, I wanna make sure we cover globe ruptures because again, this is one of the most important things and it's something you never wanna miss. And again, the globe should be round. Now we get artifact, we get artifact from bone, we get artifact from patients moving, we get artifact from dental uh, material sometimes People with trauma have had a prior episode of trauma. We used to say in Philadelphia that one of the most important risk factors for you know, trauma to the eye was a previous episode of trauma. Um, and so it's not always a one-time event and there may be mini plate or microplate and metallic artifact that makes it hard for you to see the eyes. But when I look over here, this looks wrong. The eye is not round. It looks like there's an overlapping part here, like it's broken. And this is an example of a globe rupture in the coronal plane. So always look at this, make sure it's round. And if it's not, you wanna get more imaging and uh, you wanna to try to get, figure out what's going on. Same thing here. I've got a pretty normal looking globe on the right, uh, you know, slightly ovoid. You know, globes aren't perfectly globular. They're usually you know, a little bit ovoid, but this looks normal. It's got a nice sharp edge to it. And just like I was saying about the spinal cord, I passed that. Here, it looks like somebody's let the air out of the tire of, of my bicycle or out of a car. Um, this is, looks like it's kind of you know, sagging and it doesn't look right. And this is a globe rupture. And sometimes these can be fairly subtle. And so you know, just always look carefully and make sure it's pristine. If it's not pristine, you want to alert them because sometimes globe ruptures are obvious. I'll show you an obvious one in a moment, but Sometimes they're fairly subtle, so be careful. So with trauma, um, one of the problems, as I said earlier, that we run into with trauma is sometimes there are too many things going on. And sometimes we get tired of mentioning all of them. Sometimes we focus on 
some, but we don't focus on everything. And it's important that you be complete. And that's why the, the, one of the themes of this talk is to make sure that you have you know, a, a structured, you know, pretty rigorous approach to this because it, that'll just reduce the chance that you'll miss something and in particular miss something that's particularly important. So here's a case of severe trauma. And we see that there's preceptal soft tissue swelling. We see that there's a nasty blowout fracture here. There's air. Um, if we look at the fat, the fat looks pretty clean on the normal side, the unaffected side, but here the fat's all injected. So we know that there's he hemorrhage back here, inflammation back here, something's going on. And most of those things were discussed. And, you know, but when you look, there's more, the more, you know, it's just another slice. You see that there's soft tissue swelling, there's the air. The medial rectus is huge. Here's a normal medial rectus. This one's obviously swollen. It's got edema. It probably has a hematoma in the medial rectus. The medial check ligament here looks to me like it's probably been ripped, ripped off. This, uh, I should never be this far lateral from here. Here's a normal medial check ligament. That's part of the septum. That looks normal. Um, the fat here is injected. So there's definitely blood in the intraconal fat. But the most important finding here, and this is just one of these things where, you know, I happened to sit down and I looked at this and said, hmm, uh, nobody mentioned something that I thought was pretty important. This was somebody who had normal vision until they had this traumatic event. And I, I think this was like a golf club injury or something like that, but they got hit hard in the face, a nasty hit, but a young person with normal vision. Now their vision was in the, the parlance that we use, the way we, we talk about it in North America, they now had 2,400 vision, which is terrible. Normal is 20 over 20, this is 20 over 400. So um, very poor vision, very substantial visual loss. And the thing that bothered me the most about this is here's a normal optic nerve inserting onto the, you know, the globe. And over here, there's this sort of V-shaped material, which doesn't belong there. And that's in a potential space that's called tenon space. That's an eponym, T-E-N-O-N. And it can create a compartment syndrome where that blood pushes on the optic nerve and can diminish their vision. So this rescan was done because this patient's vision was getting worse. And we suggested that they fenestrate this, or at least we told them about it, and they chose to fenestrate this, get some of the blood out and release that compartment syndrome. And his vision went back up to 2040, which is a very good recovery. It's not perfect, it's not back to completely normal, but it's much easier to live your life with vision that's 2040 than vision that's 2400. And with that, I am out of time. I hope that this has been helpful to you. I wanna thank everyone for listening. And I again wanna thank um, Dr. Badia for introducing me and Dr. Rahani for putting all this together. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Alexa, for taking the time to present. That was an amazing lecture and presenting for the Pennsylvania chapter of Health for the World. And thank you, Dr. Rahani and Sharma and everyone at Health for the World for the amazing work in this organization. Uh, such a great mission. And we are truly grateful, Dr. Alexa, for the detailed and educational lecture so, to such a complex topic. But I really like that systematic approach that's, I think, very helpful to everyone. Um, sometimes you get lost within all the, the multiple areas to look for, but the systematic approach is very, I think, very helpful to trainees as well. Um, so, and also thank you to everyone attending from across the world. We have representation from, I'll just highlight a few, from Nigeria, from Los Angeles, from Zambia, Uganda. Uh, so we've had a, a great turnout. And I think there are some questions. So if that's Alexa, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and answer a few questions. Okay. No, I'm happy to. I've got time. So let's... Ask away. All right, let's do it. All right, the first one. So it, you mentioned a lot of the the detailed, uh, most important things you don't want to miss. As far as an, an ophthalmologist, after you've described the fracture to them, what are some additional findings in addition to the, just the fracture of the bones? What else do you want to describe that would be helpful to them, such as uh, extraocular muscle involvement or anything else? 
Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, again, I was trying to give a, an overview, but um, I think that, yes, at a more granular level, it's very helpful to an ophthalmologist that she or he know if there's um, a hematoma associated with the fracture that might benefit from being evacuated. They want to know if, you know, in the example I, I showed of the lateral rectus, if the bone is actually pushing on or displacing the muscle. Um, with the inferior blowouts, um, there's actually, you should let them know if the muscle has sagged down below the orbital rim because they're much more likely to go in and do a full repair if the muscle is displaced inferiorly. So number of fragments, hematoma, muscle swelling, muscle impingement, and the degree of displacement of the muscles into the adjacent sinuses in the case of an inferior or a medial blowout are all things that they would like to know. That's a good point. Yeah, I was, yeah, focus on extra extra muscles and um, those findings that were mentioned. That's a good, uh, good summary of everything that should be in the radiology report for sure. And you also mentioned uh, in some areas you might see more common fractures than others, like the medial wall fracture you mentioned. You might see more commonly in like your area maybe. Is there any studies or any information on uh, the, the cause of a trauma more likely to cause this type of fracture? Like if it's, I know skydiving is probably not your more uh, common injury, but. <laughs> Well, I think um, it depends where you are and it depends, you know, I don't, I haven't seen a formal study, but if you ask me to hypothesize, I think it depends on how people fight with each other because many of the orbital injuries are related to, you know, people fighting and it depends on how people hit each other and what they hit each other with. Um, in, you know, in some places, I think you're much more likely to have people using their fists and hitting each other in the face. And I think that that contributes to some of this. Um, okay. And it, it's like nasal fractures. In some parts of the world, nasal fractures are common because people punch each other in the nose and other parts of the world, people don't fight that way. So I think they're <laughs> probably be interesting. If somebody wants to write a paper, that would be a really fun paper to write because it probably does relate to that kind of behavior. Yeah, definitely. That's a uh, that's interesting. So we're we're getting much more uh, comments and questions now. So I'll just also mention. Um, thank you, Dr. Alexa. That was excellent. Some some nice comments from everyone in the the audience. Thank you, Frank. Excellent presentation. Nice to hear your voice. That was from William Miller. Uh, thank you. Great lecture. Another great comment. Uh, so there is a question uh, that I'm not quite familiar with either. Do you always have to do complementary ultras ultrasound scan and orbital trauma or CT suffices from your experience? Well, that's a good question. And that is actually a, a global cultural question because um, in most of the places where I work, ocular ultrasound is actually in the domain of the ophthalmologist rather than in the domain of the radiologist. Um, so it depends where you are and it depends on what kind of damage you're looking for. Um, it is complementary if you have either flagged on the CT that you think there might be a chorioretinal detachment, or you think there's vitreal hemorrhage, or you think there's a problem with the vitreal, vitreous pulling up, um, or you know those types of intraocular injuries, then ultrasound can be very helpful. But usually the ultrasound is done by the ophthalmologist, at least in the places where I've worked, which is too bad because it would, it would be nice for us to kind of control it start to finish. But it's just an example of where we have different specialties with different domains. The time where they're more likely to order one, even if we say that the globe looks good, we don't see any intraocular blood, we don't see any evidence for a detachment, is when the patient has unexplained visual loss. So we have somebody like that gentleman who I showed as my last case, who previously had documented and it was documented on his driver's license, all that, that he had normal vision. They've been hit and we don't see anything on the CT. And if the ophthalmologist can get a good dilated look in, they may decide not to do any more imaging. 
But if they have unexplained visual loss, then they will want to do an ultrasound or some other technology to look. One of the things where we offer and can offer and have at times changed management is doing an MR and seeing evidence for either edema and or some hemorrhage in the optic nerve, which is hard to see on a CT, particularly if there's other damage around it, but just generally it's hard to see subtle things in the optic nerve, even if there isn't surrounding damage. So that's how the multiple modalities interface. That's a good point. Is it? I mean, I didn't even think about that. With pediatrics, we do a lot of ultrasound, and that might be a nice uh, a collaboration with the CT imaging or mm -hmm. um, just evaluate. But yeah, it's true. We don't do that. Uh, that's kind of held by the ophthalmology team. And actually, it was my next question was MRI. What role does that play in orbital trauma? But you answer that. It's pretty nice because I've done some recent work on uh, renal hemorrhage imaging with high-level high resolution SWI imaging. And I've seen a lot of other work on actual optic nerve high resolution imaging with MR. And that's a little difficult to do globally, but it's kind of like the direction uh, orbital trauma is heading. So that's very, uh, very helpful to know. Thank you. And one other question, uh, how do you describe different angulation of inferior rectus complex without obvious herniation? And thank you for your great lecture. Oh, yeah, I, I think that, um... You can, have ret you can have displacement of the inferior complex with edema or hemorrhage without an obvious fracture. And um, there are also some subtle fractures, not, not to scare anyone, um, but there are sometimes very subtle fractures that are hidden by adjacent hematomas. So you may not have a big displaced inferior fracture like, you know, the ones that I just showed, but you may have a crack in the inferior um, orbit, particularly if it, if it goes into the groove um, for the inferior orbital nerve, which may be very hard to see because of overlying hematoma, things like that. And so if your ophthalmologists are convinced that there's you know, damage to the in, in inferior orbit and or the, the muscle complex, but you're not seeing it on the CT, then it's like some other things that I see every day in adult neuroradiology in the brain, which is once the swelling and the hematoma resolve, you go back and take a look and see what's underneath it. And sometimes you will see that there's an, a relatively non-displaced fracture that now has some fibrosis, and that's probably the cause of why this person still can't read a book because they, they still have some vertical diplopia. Yeah, good point. That's a, very helpful. And <clears throat> I think we have answered the questions and a lot of more great feedback coming in from everyone from across the world. Uh, such a comprehensive lecture. Thank you, Dr. Alexa. So we do thank you for your time and your dedication to global education, Dr. Alexa. We really appreciate it. Very educational. We've learned a lot and hope to see everyone in, in person. I hope everyone's staying healthy. All right. Thanks again. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Badia. Thank you.